will start soon the, well, actually, no, we will start the, the last session of this conference. So thanks again for still being here. And we, we have two fascinating talks coming, one by Carl Widerquist, uh, who will start first, and then afterwards, Eva Weyler. We, we really want to thank Carl um, significantly because he accepted to make this presentation in a, in a very last minute way. And we are really happy that he accepted because that's something that we, we wanted to do and we had to uh, renunciate because we had too many speakers, but due to the, um, the, the annulations in last minute, we, we were able to reschedule Carl's intervention. So we are really happy about that. So in a nutshell, uh, Carl Widerquist is professor at Georgetown University, Qatar. Uh, it was one of the speakers of the keynotes um, in the previous conference on why private property one that was held in ULB three or four years ago. I don't remember exactly. Um, he's well known for his work on basic income. Uh, he was a co-chair of the basic, earth in, uh, basic income earth network, and he published many books on uh, basic income. Uh, I just cite independence, propertylessness, and basic income, which is I think his most important book. At least you should read it. <laughs> Uh, he also recently published a prehistoric myth in modern political theory, and very recently he published the prehistory of private property. Uh, and it is about this book that is going to uh, to make a presentation of the main findings. So, Carl, the floor the floor is yours. And thanks again. All right, thank you very much. Uh, now, the question: Why private property? really uh, has uh, two elements. I think we, we one element I think that mostly the idea of this conference is focusing on is why should property exist or why should it be changed? Why should it not exist? So why the, the sh why should? But there's um, a, but why private property could also mean why does private property rights exist? Uh, the private property rights system exist. And those two questions are actually very intertwined because a lot of arguments about why supposedly it must exist and should exist have to do with, uh, with how it supposedly came about and what happens in its absence. Uh, so uh, this is the second of two books of mine that are really looking into relevant questions about that. Uh, two books that Grant S. McCall and I have published together. I'm a political theorist. He's a philosopher. He, he, sorry, he's an anthropologist. So we're covering both ends of the relevant literature. We're using anthropological, archaeological, and historical evidence to debunk claims about history and prehistory that are used in contemporary political philosophy. Uh, the first book, Prehistoric Myths in Modern Political Philosophy, the second one, The Prehistory of Private Property, and both use the same methodology, which is we're showing that people really use these claims. And then we're debunking the claims with evidence. Uh, and both are extremely important because we're not challenging the idea that there could be a useful dichotomy between between a priori reasoning and empirical reasoning. But what we're criticizing is people who are sneaking in some really key foundational empirical uh, claims into their arguments and distracting attention from them and uh, focusing attention on the a priori pure reasoning elements of these things. And it is those those ideas, those empirical claims that are put to the background are often presented in a very sloppy way that, well, do we really need this claim? Are they really relying on that claim? Are they really trying to say this? Uh, well, those kind of claims where they're just kind of put off to the side are actually uh, that ambiguity of how they're proposed helps protect them from scrutiny. So uh, in each book, about half of the book is, is intellectual uh, history and uh, and uh, analysis of argument to show that yes, they really do when you get down to the bottom of the argument, there is nothing else to back up their other claims other than this empirical claim about the nature of the property system or the history of the property rights system or what things are like in the absence of the property rights system. And that's what we're showing in these two books. And between the two books, they debunk four empirical claims that are still widely used and widely believed in contemporary uh, political theory. Um, and uh, 
so the four claims are what we have we've named the claims the claims uh have snuck into the background and people aren't looking at them closely uh and so we're the first people to, to give them these names we, we so we've named the claims we've uh, uh these aren't common names we call them the hobbesian hypothesis all the or the mutual advantage hypothesis the inequality hypothesis the market freedom hypothesis and the individual appropriation hypothesis the first book debunks the first claim the entire book is dedicated to the first claim we we're going to write a book about all these claims and it couldn't fit in one book so the first book debunks this claim the hobbesian hypothesis the second one debunks the inequality hypothesis the market freedom hypothesis and the individual hypothesis i'm going to just uh briefly explain the first three claims and then focus this presentation on the fourth claim the appropriation hypothesis now the hobbesian hypothesis or the mutual advantage hypothesis is the idea that either the government or the property rights system or both um achieves actually achieves mutual advantage it is equivalent to saying the lockean proviso is fulfilled saying oh well you can establish a government if that makes everybody better off. Uh, Hobbes says, well, yes, it does. It does make everybody better off. Well, that's an empirical claim. The moral claim is the, the Lockean proviso is a moral claim. You've got to do this to achieve that. The Hobbesian hypothesis is the factual claim that yes, in fact, we have, uh, we have, um, we 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 have satisfied the locking pro proviso mutual advantage is achieved by the property rights system and or by the state it's all been fulfilled and we we debunked that in book one saying if you look at how if you actually look at how people actually look in the absence of a private property system and small scale stateless societies with no government and uh and no private property and land the least off people among that group are better off than the least off people among our group. And so we do not have mutual advantage and we do know how to have a mutual advantage society. You have a parasitic society and that's what we have. Okay, and so in the second book, the inequality hypothesis in, is addressed in chapters two through four. That's the idea that inequality, meaning significant hierarchy or stratification is natural and inevitable. Um, that is that equality is, or, or it can be structured in the sense that equality, in, equality is incompatible with negative freedom or impossible altogether. That uh, inequality is the natural outcome of a free society um, or, um, is one way of characterizing this. And this inequality hypothesis, we show how it's been, been characterized in many different ways throughout history. Uh, but it keeps resurfacing as a justification for for a uh, a lot of really oppressive policies and forceful policies to protect what is supposedly going to happen naturally. Uh, then the market freedom hypothesis is the hypothesis that uh, that it's that the market economy protects negative freedom rather, better than any other system. And what we look at is the least free people in stateless societies with a common property regime are actually far freer than the least free people in contemporary societies those are the first three claims that we debunk i refer you to the books for those three claims but i'm going to get on to uh, a more thorough presentation of the individual appropriation hypothesis which i think comes closest to the why question the uh, the two why questions that I started with why should property exist and why does property exist because there's the argument well well one classic argument for the private property rights system is based on what we call the individual appro appropriation hypothesis that or the natural property hypothesis and that is that there is something natural about the private property system that individualistic unequal ownership of private property develops naturally while other systems such as common property regimes collective property regimes regulated property regimes these things all involve interference with 
the naturally developing system of private property. Another way to state this is that the application of the normative principles of appropriation and voluntary transfer in the real world history supports a strong private property system with significant ethical limits on any collective power to tax, regulate, or redistribute property. So what we're not doing here is questioning the appropriation principle. Very often when you have people talking about using an appropriation-based argument for private property, is that people will take will we'll take as given that, well, if you have appropriation, that's going to be private appropriation. And so I'm going to criticize the morality of the appropriation principle. But when you do that, you are conceding to the supporters of a strong private property rights system that if we allow appropriation to happen, the appropriators are going to establish a private property system. And what our thought is, well, is that really true? Is that what the first people to mix their labor with the land, is that what they established? Is that why we have a private property system? Because that's what the first appropriators did? Or do we have the property rights system for some other reason? Why does the private property rights system exist? So a lot really rests on this income of interest idea of why we have the property rights system. Now, this, this assessing this claim takes up about half of the book. Uh, the first two are fairly easy. This one takes a lot of history. So in chapters seven to nine, we discuss the history of the hypothesis, the meaning uh, we, uh, uh, from Locke's appropriation story and Locke's appropriation principle is where it really makes a big way into, uh, into, contemporary, into contemporary thought. Or you can trace some, some ideas of it going back to ancient Rome. Uh, and uh, we, um, we, we establish the need for an empirical premise in propertarian theory. Um, there is a very strong, and, and this also has to do with another instance of sloppy presentation that we've talked about. They hide these, the, these unquestioned claims are the ones that are hidden, uh, the ones that aren't paying very much scrutiny, scrutiny to. Uh, there's a lot of scrutiny to say, well, do you, the appropriator, uh, so you, the current property of, uh, owner, have a connection to the original appropriator. And everybody agrees, the critics of property and the supporters of private property agree that the current property holders have no connection or can't show an unbroken chain of voluntary transfers going back to the original appropriator who supposedly did one of five things. First use, first claim, first occupation, or first labor, or fourth, uh, several other things. There's different ideas of what makes appropriation happen. But everybody agrees that everybody on both sides agrees there is no connection to the original appropriator. But yet, the supporters of appropriation still refer to this principle and tell the story of the appropriator. Um, and they do this, we argue, because what the empirical claim is not that there's this unbroken chain of connection, but there's an empirical claim is that that's what property is. That's what property owners do. That's what human beings as a part of their nature want to do. They want to take resources and make them their own. They want to appropriate. So it doesn't matter who the original appropriators were. There'd be some set of private owners now, and there'd be other people that some would own more, some would own less. So we, but we'd have this system. If we had appropriation, we would have this system. So the idea is to redress any grievance, any, any redress, any uh, uh, any crimes that we know of, any any violations that we know of. And, but then maintain this system that would develop naturally. But that is the one that 
neither side wants to look at. Opponents of property have not been saying appropriation does not, whether appropriation ever actually happened. Uh, they've just been questioning the connection to appropriation. Whereas the private property advocates have been glad to say we don't have this connection, but appropriation, that's what creates property. That's why we have the system. And that's why whatever redistribution we do must maintain this system. And that implies significant ethical limits on collective power to tax, regulate, and redistribute property, because that all presumably comes at the expense of the freedom and the natural rights of the private property holder. Now, if, but if it is true, but is that really where where property comes from if this was true if this idea that there's something natural about private property was true then we the history of the world should show constantly thwarted attempts to establish property rights and we should see violent and when i say uh constantly thwarted attempts to establish private property rights systems and we should see violent disappropriation of private property holders. That's what we should see in history if the hypothesis is true that there is something natural about the private property rights system. We should see that the first people to claim, use, occupy, or mix their labor with the land would tend or always established individual private property. Then we should see these violent people coming in thwarting that. That's what we will see if this hypothesis is true. Oh, well, let's then look at the evidence. Uh, what evidence do we have to see this is true? Um, and if you go through a uh, chapter 10 of the book goes through uh, evidence that propertarians, uh, I do not like to call them right libertarians, uh, or libertarians because they're not entitled to the term liberty. What they support is not freedom, but they will support property rights at the expense of freedom. So propertarian is a much more accurate term. Or perhaps uh, if I've read P Picati's latest book uh, before uh, before we wrote this, we might be called a propriet proprietarianism, which is what he calls, it, at least in the English translation. Uh, so most propertarian literature will just simply assert this claim and often assert the ridiculousness of challenging this claim with no citations whatsoever to empirical evidence at all. Most of them do that. Those who do cite tend to cite a short passage by F.A. Hayek. And F.A. Hayek cites three sources. And there's are genuine anthropological sources, all of which we look at and none of which back them up. If the, all of them, in fact, caution against looking at, at, at property rights in or, or even land tenure institutions in very different societies, at looking at them in the way, and looking at them in this dichotomy between uh, the dichotomy between private and public or, or private and socialist, the way. Uh, the way our systems do. So he gets his sources wrong. So there's really, in all these years uh, since Locke, they've never got provided good empirical support for this premise, which is already good reason to doubt it. But let's actually look. So what we do then is then we spend four chapters um, going through the history and prehistory of the private property system. And the prehistory of it is very long because it doesn't really begin in a major way until the last uh, 500 years or so. Uh, so in chapter 11, we look at the private pro the, the property systems in hunter-gatherer societies. We also look a little bit at animal uh, property rights to the extent that's relevant. Uh, but land tenure systems among nomadic uh, hunter-gatherers, we look at what they have. And what they have is common property where it's, it, Hunter-gatherers who are live in small-scale nomadic bands, not hunter-gatherers who settle down and are fishing along a river and have a, a big society based on fishing or something like that, but nomadic hunter-gatherers um, who, who uh, occupied uh, five of the six inhabited continents before any other form of social organization was invented, tended to have common property regimes that tended even one group's 
area where they were, where, where they hunted and gathered overlapped with other groups. No individual had to stick with the band. Individuals could come and go and join another band uh, and no recognized private property and land almost at any level. To the extent it's, it's, it is recognized at a level, it would be at a level of, of the society as a whole, not for an individual. What the individual has is the right to hunt and gather on. Uh, and, uh, and when they hunt and gather, they also don't necessarily claim the fruit of their labor. The rule seems to be, if you want to camp with the group, anything that you hunt or gather or manufacture, a spear, a bow and arrow, a big a piece of big game, whatever, if it's, if it's enough for more than just you, uh, if it's enough for more than just you, you must share it with everyone in the camp. So they have neither private property, private property on an individual level, neither, neither in land nor in food and tools. So um, now the question, do they qualify as original appropriators? Well, they do in the sense of first use, first use of land, certainly. First claim, well, that's a dodgy one. Uh, they certainly claim that they can, they have a right to continue to use it, but you could say, oh, well, they didn't. They didn't put up hedgerows and they didn't put up no trespassing signs. So they didn't really claim it. So the uh, uh, colonial appropriators can come in there and just take it. Well, that sounds like an excuse for aggression. There's supposed to be a non-aggression principle among these people, but the non-aggression principle really means, well, we're gonna choose which rights count and which don't. And if you're, if you're violating the rights we like, then it's, it's, non, it's aggression. But if you're violating the rights we don't like, like the rights of indigenous peoples, then it's not aggression. Uh, they're in fact aggressing if they resist. Occupation, the same one. Certainly they occupy the land, they live there, they hunt on it, they gather it, uh, but they don't stay in one place. This is often used as an excuse to take land from them. And even transformation of the land with labor, which Locke proposes as the very reason to disappropriate indigenous peoples is only to some extent, is it true that they don't transform their labor with the land? Because actually the labor, the land in North America was very different after hunter-gatherers occupied the whole of it and killed some of the largest species and greatly affected what plants were living there. There are no more woolly rhinoceroses, no more saber-toothed tigers. The buffalo take over where the woolly rhinoceros and the mammoths had been. That is an enormous change. That is an enormous transformation. But they get nothing for that in private property theory. So we look at the first, the first, uh, the first people to farm the land. If you want to really want to stick to, you got to transform it enough that we can see that you transform it. Well, then you go to farmers. But you also find farming systems around the world have a trend that they th that the simplest, the oldest, uh, the most common ones are village level agriculture. Uh, Sweden agriculture, was, which was the original agriculture was slash and burn Sweden agriculture, where a group of people, usually a few hundred people, would go into an area, clear the land together, then plant the land individually, but claim for themselves, not an individual plot of land, but the right to plot the right to farm some piece of land somewhere in the group's territory. And the group made a lot of joint decisions about how to manage that territory. No, you can't plant this here because that's going to damage the that's going to damage the crops of this other person. You can you can uh, graze livestock here during certain times of years, but not others, because others it will. It will damage the plants. A lot of decisions are made at the communal level. And you see that happening first among Sweden semi-nomadic agriculturists who move every few years. But then you see a version of it among settled agriculturists who use crop rotation. You see them operating at the village level and making joint decisions about how many years can you farm this land before you have to let us make it back into grazing land. And whether you'll get the same plot or a different, then we'll give you a different plot at the next time. A lot of this village 
agriculture happens. And gradually what you see is chiefs start putting themselves on top of the village and then maybe stringing several villages together and becoming chiefs. And what you have as you, go, as you transition to this into a state society is more and more of these chiefs putting in a higher and more and more parasitic layers until you get up to somebody who you could really call a king. But a lot of kingdoms throughout the world, throughout the world in India, in medieval Europe, in, in, uh, in Central America had a similar system where it's still this sort of communal village agriculture with uh, this layer of uh, chiefs on top. Now that's not always true in big, in big um, societies like Egypt and Mesopotamia, where you've got big uh, and we got big irrigation projects, you tend to have the whole thing centrally organized. But where you're not getting is the individual plot, that really individual unregulated plot. You don't get that anywhere. Where you do start to get individual private property in the ancient world, it starts from the top down. It starts from the the king saying, this is my, this part is my exclusive property. Everything else is my domain, but this is my exclusive property. And then, oh, and now the queen's going to get one too. Oh, and the duke is going to get one too. And this lower official is going to get some. And it, it starts from the top down. Private property in the ancient world is the creation of the state, not something that the state comes along and asserts power over, but it it asserts power, the state violently asserts power over, over communes of people and then imposes the private property system up there over a period of thousands of years. And even as late as about 500 years ago, this sort of communal agricultural system was still very common in Europe and in many places around the world. And beginning in the 1400s, you see two parallel trends that start to transform this into the private property rights system. It is the enclosure movement in Europe and the colonial movement of Europeans throughout the rest of the world where they start to impose this system. And when you get property rights rhetoric, when you get people like, uh, like John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and, and, and Blackwell and, and others uh, talking about talking about modern society and all of these things, um, you get uh, these people are all writing as this transformation is happening and are certainly aware that the type of property that they're portraying as natural is not something that naturally developed in most places. They're really sort of propagandizing for how you they want you to think of property when in fact, what the original appropriators are doing is setting up something very different and they are using violence and coercion to force the, the first people to claim, occupy, uh, uh, and mix their labor with the land, to force them off the land and now let this parasitic layer of chiefs and lords and kings, let them take full control and then when they control the land, the land fully, they also control the labor of everyone else because everyone else has no means to make their own living and can only go to the owners of resources to put this thing. Now, I'm summarizing five chapters of a book very quickly. So, uh, uh, so, I'm, so uh, my apologize for how quickly this is going. If there's anything that went too fast, be happy to answer questions about this. But we, our conclusion to this section of the book is that the appropriation hypothesis is not only unproven, it is disproven. It is simply false. The first people to discover, claim, use, occupy, or mix their labor with the land. Oh, that's the fifth one that I was missing before, discover. Discover, claim, use, occupy, or mix their labor with the land. These five criteria that property rights advocates will give you for, uh, for why appropriation must exist. The first people to do those things establish a complex, overlapping, flexible, non-spatial, and partly collective tenure, 
land tenure systems with significant common elements. And what Grant and I mean by common elements is land that is simply, or other resources that is simply there available for everyone to use, but for no one to take possession of. That is the property right system that naturally developed if you follow what propertarians say is natural, which is allow people to discover, occupy, use, claim, and mix their labor with land and, and create whatever institutions you want. If you follow that normative claim, the facts of history say that this is the natural system and that the private property system necessarily involves violent coercion and disappropriation of the people who actually appropriated the property. So the, the why and the how of the system that we've been told are false. And we need to fight back and look and see what's wrong with this. The people and the community have a better claim to land and resource ownership than the unequal property system that we have. Land is not merely a convention. It is a convention imposed by the upper class on everyone else through a violent process in, in order to get not only the land, but also the labor of the people who once they are completely dispossessed, have no other choice but then to go work for the landowners. That is the history of the property rights system. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carl, for this very short insight of your, of your last chapter. It was really fascinating. I really like this kind of empirical verification of these kind of claims. Um, Maybe just to, to give the time to the room uh, to, to think about questions, uh, I'd like to, to start the discussion. Um, and I, I think, well, I, I, what I really enjoy in your talk and, and in your, your book is, is that what you show is that the, the right paradigm for thinking about the origin of private property, it's, it's not Robinson Crusoe or, or the Lockean story of the individual alone in the state of nature somehow, but it's well, the, the right way to think about it is quite a paradigm of enclosures. It's basically how you have people at the origins that have some way of functioning and organizing to the relation to the land and which, which are of course related to how they organize together as a group. And suddenly someone is saying, well, <laughs> we, we stop with that, we go with this kind of property rights system. And it's, well, this is the picture you take of the chief taking control. And I think it's, uh, it's yeah, it's really promising because uh, it has some quite interesting consequences for how we have to think about property today. Uh, first of all, if the original story is not that much a story of appropriation in the state of nature, but rather somehow a, a story of expropriation, that's the original question. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really changes the picture and all this kind of literature on well, uh, okay, what is a Lockean? Close. Well, what is like the Lockean proviso that we have to fulfill in order for appropriation to be legitimate? Here, well, we, we really reverse the picture somehow. We, we are like, okay, if private property finds its origin, it's kind of violent uh, expropriation. Well, what should be the compensation that we could offer somehow for um, uh, for for this original expropriation? So I think it's it's really interesting, and well, also an, another idea that I think is quite. Um, turned around by this way uh, and the way you and what you present in your book is the idea that while well, private property might find its legitimation in the idea that it promotes individual autonomy and and you know that's, it's like the the right basis for developing li individual liberty and well when we looked at your story and this story that you reconstruct it's quite the opposite here i mean the the rise of private property system it's it's it goes with new dependences and it goes with the violent expropriation of chiefs and so some new domination structure somehow so it also kind of changed the picture uh, here because in your story we well I, I find it difficult to find how the people expropriated them more free than before so it also changed that uh, just two very brief questions and i hope afterwards there uh, are questions in the room um uh, I remember I read, I think it was in the last uh, issue of Jacobin, uh, there was an interview of an anthropologist that was also looking to uh, the origin of private property system. And one of 
the the key um, thesis of the article was to say, well, we, we usually we see private property system develop uh, when we have uh, the, the start of irrigation works. Uh, and because that's the moment when the hunter gatherers kind of settle uh, because there is some form of investment in the land. Uh, we, it needs quite a lot of work to create the irrigation system. And well, that was it's one of the examples you mentioned, but uh, it was also mentioning another aspect uh, which is more symbolic, uh, not really economic, but uh, it was saying the creation of cemeteries and the idea that, well, at some point we, we do uh, attach some value to the, to the ancestors or to the old people that are dead and we want to preserve somehow the land what, what they are buried. And this kind of new relation to the land, um, especially in the case of irrigation uh, systems, uh, well, it provides somehow uh, a possible grip for chiefs to take control, because what changes, uh, according to this anthropologist, I, I don't remember his name, I'm sorry about that, but he said really well, what happens is that, well, the irrigation system is created by the whole community generally, and then at some point, there is a chief saying, okay, well, we take control of that, I do take decisions on how we allocate that and what we're going to do next, and that's the whole development of the property system. And what I think is, um, what I think is interesting is that it might allow us to also um, have a new look to the property question saying, well, finally, the, the main question in the property system is, isn't it the question of hierarchy um, and how this kind of, you know, vertical domination system, which is mostly symbolic. I mean, you can, you can also have some kind of hierarchy without having property rights as such. And that would be like the second aspect of the question. Uh, and I think why it is so interesting also to think of property rights, not that much in terms of legal rights or legal creations, something like that, but just as in terms of how uh, property rights, are, well, primarily some kind of control rights, giving some power to some individuals over others. And if you take the question this way, well, finally, the question of property is kind of uh, replaced by the question of uh, well, the economic organization somehow, or the question of bu bureaucracy somehow. And when you look to this question this way, you also realize that uh, private property is not only about like the company, the private company or something like that. If, if, if we think private property is about like uh, power relation in the organization, then it's also about bureaucracy. It's also about like all the bureaucracy of the, well, the administration of the government and stuff like that. And it's something that is really a wider question because it's mostly a question of who controls who and what is this kind of vertical hierarchy. So I think that's maybe one of the promising things that we can really uh, see starting from your example. I'm sorry, it's not really a question, it's more, more of a comment. But... <laughs> that's, all right. that's all right, I have several responses. Um, yeah, and you know, one thing about, you know, why the Lockean story sounds so plausible to us and apparently happens uh, in the United States and Canada and Australia, you get people going out in the wilderness and clearing the land and making it their own with their own efforts. Uh, it looks like, well, isn't that a historical example of this? And isn't that what farmers would want to do? Well, that's what farmers want to do after the private property system has already been established in that area. And all of those places, those, those, private people who are going out and, 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 and creating their individual ownership of land are, are in places where government power has already thinned the indigenous population through disease and through, uh, through outright violence, has already thinned the population and is beginning to assert control even if they are in advance of it and created this property system and is protecting a trading system where they can expect that they will get help from the army to defend these property rights and they will be able to grow their, their monoculture if they need it and sell this in the market. That's when people will, that's when people will appropriate private property. But if you're living outside of all those government institutions, you don't want to go out by the woods by yourself and start your own farm all by yourself. You want to go with a group of people who can rely on each other. So well, then you have a bad year, somebody else has a good year, and you can help each other. That's why the system that looks 
plausible to us is only plausible to us because they, they we're already enculturated into the system and the people who look like they're doing this who are actually disappropriating others are doing it this way because they've been acculturated and and not only enculturated but in a system that's created where that's the only viable option um now you definitely there are lots of hierarchies without property rights and you get a lot of ancient societies and a lot of chiefdoms without really a strong sense of what private property is who are very hierarchical you do get it in, the, in some ancient societies in the cities in ancient and medieval Europe, you do get some sense of private property, but in the rural areas and in most of the rest of the world, um, you never get a strong sense of private property until the enclosure and the colonial movement. You get, and there's so many other ways to administer hierarchy without it. In Hawaii, before, just before uh, it got uh, taken over by, by Westerners, you got uh, a, an, almost a completely top-down society where the, where the paramount chief appoints lesser chiefs who appoint these local managers. And these local managers kind of act like property owners, except for they could, because they, they tell the, they hire people and they tell them what to do and they can keep some of the profit, but they can be hired and fired by the higher ups in the hierarchy all the time. So really they're just an employee, but you can see a private property system there developing from the direct assertion of the king and the Lord's power. Well, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I have two questions. One is just a quick one out of curiosity. What do you make of John Locke well, referring to the individual um, appropriating the ground, but, but then he's actually is the serf and the horse. So there seems to be at least a family, if not a community, actually behind the the the, the individual who um, appropriates um, the earth. And I think Tully has a reading that is kind of alluding to that. Just uh, yeah. Um, so and the and the, and the other question would be. Henry George actually tells, mm. I think, this story of, um, or he, he conceptualizes um, economic relationships like the ones you were just were, were talking about. Um, and I know that Henry George was very influential and uh, at his lifetime, but then that somehow um, ceased. And I don't know if you know anything about, or if you have any idea why that is, because he would actually, I mean, his, his uh, concept of, of the society is a fictional one, but he really tells the story from we appropriated the earth together and then um, and, and we have to pay attention that this is actually a communal thing. Yeah, we're certainly not the first first people who have questioned these claims and uh, especially in the first book when we're looking at the history of the people who have questioned these claims. Uh, uh, Henry George, along with Thomas Paine. And to some extent, Marx and Engels and, other, and uh, uh, Peter Kropotkin especially come up as heroes of people who are saying, look, this, this might not be right. All, all, all four of these claims, people are saying this now. Um, but what we're doing here that's different from what they were doing is that Henry George has a really good idea that not everybody benefits from the system. I don't remember him saying much about the origin of the system. Marx and Engels get more into the origin of the system, but they're always, they're looking at class struggle, whether than this, what we are doing is, is so, uh, is what these other people are doing, they're, they're questioning this, but also usually asserting a different moral theory with it. What we're doing is looking at all of these claims just with the application of existing social contract theories and property rights theories just applying those theories. We're not proposing any new theory. We're showing what these theorists, so we're applying it to what these theorists are saying and not applying it to anything else and going into great detail. Uh, and so when you have people like Payne and Henry George looking at this, they are questioning the moral things and questioning them from this, uh, from this vantage point but they don't have the empirical information that we do. The most extensive study that's along these lines that I know of prior to us is, is Peter Kropotkin, but that's 120 years ago. 
and it is and we've got much better anthropological information that he did so in a much ways we're extending peter kropotkin but the difference between us and kropotkin is that we're more focused on simply evaluating the mainstream theories is what they say true he's like well what they say isn't true and and let me show this case for this other thing um so he's not as focused on look this is wrong which is really the point of our book um so we are we are we're sort of extending and refocusing Kropotkin. Now, George's influence was big for a long time and faded away. I think that is part of that has to do with mainstream economics not wanting to hear about it. Uh, mostly, they just kind of wanted to write these issues out and they have ignored him and ignored him. And also, some of his followers fell into being cultists and that hasn't helped them. Um, and so that's, I think, if you're if the question is about why his influences fall away, but he's still he's you know he's not somebody that should be venerated as the man who solved everything the way some of his followers do, but he is somebody who should be brought back as a hugely important figure in the history of 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 thought about property. Well, thanks, thanks, Cal. Um, before switching to the next presentation, I, I just want to make a, a very last remark on the consequence also of your your inquiry for thinking like the relation between private property and the environment, because I, I remember reading an article by Demsets, I think, mm -hmm. well, well, what is what is what is trying to do is to make a kind of a natural, yeah, an argument to, to show that the development of property systems is natural, well, of course, the development of private property system is natural, uh, because it's a way for uh, hunter gatherer groups to internalize externalities. So it's, it's like, I think it's kind of at the very beginning of the economics of property rights. And so basically what it's showing is that um, you have different tribes in a territory and they start to create property rights because it's a way to allocate rights on who is going to hunt where, because otherwise, uh, yeah, it's kind of the, the free riding problems and everybody wants to hunt more game and everything. So I don't know if that's something you, you might want to also refute it oh. violently, I think. <laughs> That's... Yeah. Oh, yeah. We uh, we cite Demzets in, uh, I think, both of the books, or at least one of the books. Um, and we also cite people that look a little more deeply into them. What Demzets does not show that, he does not actually look very hard at Native peoples and actually show them doing this thing. What he does is he looks at well, there's a use. For property rights and property rights can be used in order to solve these problems and create these efficiency gains. Um, then he just simply jumps from that to a sort of a Hayekian spontaneous order argument and then so that's probably why they developed. So they probably just simply developed to solve these problems. Whereas we cite other people, and I'm blanking on the names right now, other people who've looked into that and when you look at when new property rights are created, including things like property rights in uh, in the broadcast spectrum, you will find that what the private actors tend to do is either lobby the government to go in and do it or wait for the government to do it, is that this uh, spontaneous order of just creating property rights to solve these problems and fixing them, uh, there's not really a history of that, and Demzets has not done the historical work to show that there in fact is. All he's saying is that there can be benefits from it. Okay, well, if there can be benefits from it, there can also, the government can create it, and they can, if there are benefits of regulation, they can create it with regulation. And that's really as much more in the contemporary history of new property rights, that's what has mostly tended to happen. So it's not that he's wrong about, yeah, property rights can solve these problems, but he's wrong in his inference that they simply developed to solve those problems. They were created partly to solve those problems and partly to reward people who were closely connected to the people making decisions. Right. Thanks a lot, Carl. Uh, so uh, I will immediately give the floor to the second speaker and very last speaker of the conference, what did I know? Um, to Eva Weiler, which is postdoctoral researcher at the University of Essen in Germany. Um, she made a PhD on the idea of common property of earth in just naturalist literature, so Brotus hopes luck, right? And she will 
give us a very last talk, which I don't remember the title. I don't have it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah we, we changed uh, the, the title for. So I'm really curious about this one. So it's about the tale of absolute dominion and what it tends to hide the privacy of property, financialization, and dominant knowledge. And I'll let you go. Yeah, we changed place. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I hope there's still some attention capacity <laughs> at this late hour. Ah, uh, yeah. So I have a uh, not so fancy PowerPoint, but. Um... Wait, where's that one? Well, oh, I made a typo, uh, an interesting one, the tale of private property. <laughs> uh, well, tale with T-A-L-E. Um, so um, I'm referring to the call for papers um, for this for this conference. Um, there has been in in the text um, of the call for papers there has been made a link between private property and degradation of natural resources. And uh, the question was asked: Should private property be limited and controlled, or do we need new forms of property or management of natural resources? And in the call. Um, private property was described as absolute right, as an absolute right, uh, constituting a dichotomy between the private and the common, which is problematic since all private acts might affect the common and vice versa. In this paper, I want to argue that the picture of private property as absolute right is mistaken and should not be re reproduced. Property titles are absolute in a legal sense, meaning that the owner can exclude everybody else from his or her property. It does not mean that the owner's private disc discretion is unlimited or uncontrolled. I want to argue that the power of discretion we are looking for when demanding more effective limitation and control or new property regimes, like common regimes or similar alternatives, is the power to turn the rights to cultivate and manage resources into private profit. It is this power that hinders effective limitation and control and leads to exploitation of people and natural resources. So I will have four parts. Uh, first, I will explicate why we shouldn't take the absolute right, sh shouldn't talk of absolute right or absolute dominion when talking about private property. Second, I will outline how financialization and commodification in the 18th and 19th century built the basis for our modern understanding of private property rights as containing a high degree of discretion, private discretion. Thirdly, I will, in the th third part, I will show why limitation and control of modern economic actors is not effective and how this relates to what I will call the privacy of property, concentrated wealth and dominant knowledge that is created by big private economic actors. And the last part is, uh, in the last part, I will make three su suggestions how limitation and control could become more effective. Is one the tail there? It's right. <laughs> tail of absolute dominion. Um, Blackstone's dictum of property being that sole and despotic dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right or of any other individual in the universe has alongside the notion of absolute dominion and classical Roman law become what we think of when we hear the term private property. Ah, I have a different. Sorry about that. Um, well, I have put something out of my paper, which I shouldn't have. So what we have at, at the moment um, of uh, definitions of property, for example, in the German Civil Code, um, originating from 1896, um, it says the owner of a thing may, to the extent that a statute or third right 
party rights do not conflict with this, deal with the thing at his discretion and exclude others from every influence. And in the French Civil Code, it says, la propriété est le droit de jouir et disposer des choses de la manière la plus absolue pourvu qu'on n'en fasse pas un usage prohibé par les lois ou par les règlements. Um, that is to say that in the French, it's actually a, a, bit, a bit more because here it says um, la manière la plus absolue, uh, so the, the, in, a, in the most absolute manner to dispose over things. Um, and this is the situation we have now or the, the definition of um, um, private property now, and I will come to, to back to that later. Sorry for that confusion. So I have been stating what Blackstone says. If we look at the definition of property in current legal text, the German Civil Code says, and now what you have before, so I uh, uh, change the slides there. Um, um, sorry again. So we have Blackstone's <laughs> quote, and we have those co uh, um, quotes, and then I go on. Sorry about that. In English law, it's all a bit more complicated, whereas the civil law tradition defines property as ownership of things and as, right, as a right that can be enforced against everyone else. In English law, property is a much broader, less clearly defined legal term. If we look at the Law of Property Act issued in 1925, we will find the terms estate, interest, charge in or over land, share, and power before eventually in section four, property is mentioned for the first time to further explicate equitable interest in property, real or personal. But English property titles are also relative. Relativity of property as opposed to absolute rights means that a property title does not per se exclude all others from having rights in a thing, but only those whose rights are weaker. As in other fields of case law, the strength of a title has to be proven in court. At the end of the 19th century, the very small number of aristocratic landowners, namely 1.2% of families, still made up nearly 14% of England's national income. This small elite had managed to keep their wealth and status mainly by legal settings that prohibited to sale or mortgage, mortgage land or buildings and prescribed primogeniture. The land was restricted to traditional agrarian uses. No substantial alterations could be made, even if they would have meant improvements. No factory or infrastructure could be built. No mining could be done. But not only the landlord's property was restricted in use, the common lands that were shared by villages and made up a quarter of the arable land in England at the beginning of the 18th century were subject to similar restrictions. Blackstone's commentaries on the law of England with the famous formulation of the sole and despotic dominium published um, between 1765 and 1769 can be seen as the first comprehensive and systematic collection of the law of that time, and as David Shaw states in an article on Blackstone, the many different property titles prescribed in the commentaries were not exceptions to a rule, but an illustration of the fact that the bundle of rights approach to property permeated early modern English property law, especially landlord, to its core. Even the fee simple, the most complete property title right at that time was, in Blackstone's words, quote, held of some superior on conditions of rendering him service in which superior the ultimate property of the land resides, end of quote. Thus Shaw concludes, not only did absolute ownership not exist in England, it was hardly discussed even as a mythological ideal type. As Shaw shows, Blackstone's commentaries were highly influential at that time and beyond, but the phrase of property as sole and despotic dominion wasn't taken up until the 1960s to any recognizable degree and never appeared in a single British law case. So Blackstone states this, this um, um, phrase I've been quoting in the introduction to uh, the second book of four books, um, but he doesn't actually think that uh, property is that sole and despotic dominion. If we look at classical Roman law, what we find is actually not that different at least not in the classical period. Dominion might have been not uh, been clearly distinct from the power, potestas, 
um, property was relative as well, and objects were distinguished by different rights and modes of transfer that were probably seen as stemming from the character of the things themselves. That's an idea we find actually until Crotius. Um, most rights of the classical Roman period were limited insofar as they only allowed certain uses, thus dividing the control over a thing along the lines of its inherent economic and social functions. Until the 18th century in continental Europe, until the 19th century, titles of ownership were in need to all cases entangled in fixed social and economic structures. Land belonged to families or members of specific social strata or professions, not to individuals, and ownership entailed a variety of duties and responsibilities towards villages, tenants, servants, or in the Roman Empire, non-Roman freemen who lived outside the cities. Until the 19th century, in most states of continental Europe, the guilds controlled much of the immovable property of their members that could not be sold, um, and that could be sold, but not uh, be diverted to other uses than those prescribed by, by the guilds, and markets were heavily regulated. Property did eventually become a well-defined absolute right in Roman law, and in the uh, 13th, 14th century and then European civil law. If Blackstone's phrase refers to anything, it would be legal definitions of property such as the French or German one stating the discretion of the owner or a right to dispose of a thing in the most absolute manner. Nope. As we have seen above, the legal meaning of an absolute right in a thing is that nobody except the owner has a right to it, whereas a relative title might only include certain but not all rights to something and has to be proven in court. But even if the right is absolute and even if it grants discretion to the owner, civil law does of course severely limit individual discretion by stating that it may never infringe the law. The idea that property is absolute in the sense of granting absolute discretion presupposes then that legal restrictions do not really matter. This might, in a sense, be true for most of the movable things we have. Let's say in our apartment, I'm allowed to buy a sofa, use it as whatever I like. I can ex exclude, uh, exclude everybody else from its use. I can transfer or destroy it. But nearly all rights in immovables, and even more so in natural resources, are entangled in a net of legal restrictions. If I want to build a house in a piece of land I have bought in Germany, paying my property transfer taxes once and my property taxes every year, this house has to face a certain way, it has to have a certain height, and it has to fulfill certain energy standards. If the piece of land is in a housing area and I'm, I'm not allowed to just use it as a garden or build a hotel or a swimming pool instead, at least not without further permission from the authorities. I can transfer the house and the piece of land. I can exclude others from entering, but I cannot once built demolish the house without permission and I have to keep it in an habitable state. I don't want to go into the details of what happens if I buy a piece of agrarian land or an oil field, which in the German case wouldn't even be pos possible since oil is among other resources such as all kinds of metals or coal by definition property of the state in Germany. But let's just say that the restrictions become more, not less, especially with regard to environmental regulations. So what I wanted to show with this short examination of the history of property law is that private discretion is limited, especially with regard to the uses immobile property and natural resources can be put to. The cases that include a high degree of discretion are, I would claim, cases where dominion and, and imperium are not clearly separated. I cannot further develop this point here, but I take that what I just stated also to include the insight that all forms of property are and have to be limited and controlled in one way or another. The argument is this, every form of disposal over things necessarily includes the claim to a right over these things. I am allowed to dispose of them or use them. This is true for private persons as well as for collective actors, but such a claim can only be verified and secured by the social or political community. In this sense, there is no private property, but only rights to dispose of things granted by the political community to private persons. And this act of granting and defining titles will have to take place no matter what the forms of property are and no matter how the whole property regime looks like. I have this uh, picture here, which is distorted um, 
that uh, doesn't really work here. So, but <laughs> what you should see is that we have legislation of rights and we have uh, different types of um, property rights, um, which also the, the use is regulated um, and the, uh, the, re the control or management over rights has um, then certain uh, social and economic um, effects. This is not very pretty here, sorry. Um, the question we ha now have to address is why limitations and controls are not effective with regard to inequality and natural degradation. If I am right and property titles are always limited and are always part of a property regime, why don't we have the strict regulations demanded by researchers and activists? Here, I want to argue it will be more fruitful to look at how our understanding of private property changed with the financial, financialization and commodification that took place in the 18th and 19th century. Um, there had been financialization and commodification before in Italy in the 15th century, but I, that didn't really take up. <laughs> so from private property to private assets. Until the modern era, era, property was, as I noted above, entangled in complex, often rigid social and economic patterns where the resources that could be owned had a fixed place within social strata, economic life and productive production circles. Being a nobleman and having an estate, for example, meant having a secure income, but in many European countries, it also meant not being allowed to set up a business. In Germany, members of the aristocracy were simply forbidden to go into commerce, and in France, they lost their title if they traded goods that weren't produced on their own lands. Interestingly, interestingly England was different. One could become a member of the nobility by merit, and the nobility could work in commerce. Maybe that is one reason why things changed a bit faster there than in the rest of Europe. During the 18th century, England established a new financial system that was based on mainly two innovations. First, through several reforms of landed property, land could be used as collateral for loans. As I have shown above, until then, landed property was restricted in use, could not be sold, and was inherited by the eldest son. It also could not be used as a collateral. Creditors could only claim the produce of the land or half of the land itself, but only until the debt was repaid. Changing this was a long process, stating, starting with the Glorious Revolution in 1688 and lasting until the 19th century. At first, the land gentry had little interest in commodifying their estates since their whole prosperity depended on the immortal nature of their title. But when in 1694, the Bank of England was founded as what would become the second central bank in the world, Sweden was first, um, a new era of public and private money lending began. With the money from the banks and a growing manufacturing industry hugely profiting from colonialization and slave trade that made national and international investments highly profitable, incentives eventually were high, were high enough for the land gentry to put in their assets, mortgaging and selling their property. It is this second innovation, the development of the financial system, that is at the basis of our modern understanding of private property. Natural resources don't constitute a local context of economic and social bonds anymore. Property turns into commodity and asset that is sold on an ever-broadening market. Without this transformation, the reform of landed property in England and other European countries, the rise of the bourgeoisie and decline of the aristocracy, the evolution of capitalism and the modern state characterized by administrative institutions, taxation and public spending would not have taken place. The modern, uh, modern understanding of private property is thus linked to the market economy. Its market so it is the market that turned private property into assets, not private property that necessarily led to capitalist market econo economies. An extremely important characteristic of this modern understanding of property is that discretion over property is not just discretion over one's resources, but it also includes the judgment of how to best use resources within economic processes or within the market. This becomes especially clear when it is argued that taxation or market regulation for environmental reasons is expropriation since it restricts the economic freedom of producers. If we would have a national or international agreement to manage soil as a global commons, 
that could include regulations restricting the cultivation of cash crops and prescribing the cultivation of affordable food in the agrarian sector. So that could include uh, prescribing and, and regulation. Many would think this to be the end of capitalism in agribusiness. And the end of capitalism would be ascribed to regulations of private property that make it obsolete to talk of agrarian land as private property at all. But why should that be the case? The argument can't be a restriction in use since agrarian land is restricted in use by definition. So the reason to talk about expropriation has to be that the owner's ability to choose the most profitable use among all agrarian uses of his property is restricted and that regulated sectors as well as regulated markets can devalue private property to an extent that makes it more public than private. This, I suggest, is the discretionary power we are looking for if we argue um, that private property should be limited and controlled with regard to natural resources. I will now point to two elements of our um, current property regime that show both why limitation and control of this kind of discretion is not effective and why it is so, why this is so problematic. So, um, property is private discretion, privacy of property, this uh, concentrated wealth and dominant knowledge. When in the 18th and 19th century, the banking system and new um, property laws were implemented, these developments gave rise to vastly growing mechanisms of administration on the side of the state. Property had to be registered, registered, contracts had to be authenticated and enforced, taxes had to be levied. But property until this day enjoys a high degree of privacy. There is not much data on who owns what and the data that exists is often hidden from the tax and law enforcing authorities as well as from the public. However, without adequate data, it is nearly impossible to effectively tax or regulate property, or to be more precise, the owner. This is not only true for tax havens, but also for actual ownership structures like beneficial ownership. A beneficial owner is the natural person that ultimately controls a legal entity without being the registered owner, since especially many multinational corporations are subject to more than one jurisdiction and choose from different corporate laws, splitting up into a multiplicity of trusts and shares. It is near to impossible to find out who controls and benefits to what extent. This way, taxes cannot be levied and money laundering cannot be detected. The complex structures of split up trusts and affiliations is also used to circumvent antitrust laws. Opponents of transparency and taxation often refer to absolute rights, to innovation, productivity and merit of entrepreneurs. This argument is extremely powerful and still tends to convince the majority of voters in most countries. But the story is as false as it is old. Transparency does not aim at limiting entrepreneurial freedom and it aims it aims at limiting rents. And the rent here is not exercising freedom of ownership, but receiving rents, in many cases, staying completely passive. Therefore, we should not talk about absolute dominion when talking about privately owned corporations or their assets and resources. Even if we don't look at the legal norms and regulations that still limit and regulate their power, the whole structure of those entities and their ownership of resources is not that of an absolute dominion where a single owner or even a group of owners would freely dispose over things. It's rather complex, in some cases, constantly evolving and changing legal institution that runs on money that has been created, earned, inherited, borrowed, or stolen elsewhere, is commonly owned by, commonly owned by, owned by shareholders and managed by trustees who work to refund investments. We could now ask why concentrated wealth should be a problem for environmental issues. Concentrated wealth means inequality, but inequality, we could argue, does not necessarily lead to degradation of environment. 
as I emphasized above, private property is regulated. Sectors working with natural resources have to fulfill a whole range of regulations and environmental standards. And just advocate better regulations and leave wealth to wealthy people. When governments look for the best ways to mitigate climate change or fight hunger or inequality, they often and more and more exclusively turn to private economic actors to pro provide solutions. The classical theory of private property and the firm assumes that economic actors within a competitive market will find the best solutions to allocate scarce resources because they will look for the most efficient and sustainable use of resources to get maximum profit without destroying their economic basis. So without destroying natural resources they own. That makes a lot of sense in theory and is probably mostly true where firms and are managed by their owner and the owner is not himself subject to exploitative economic relations. But that's not how most of the bigger and multinational corporations operate. Ownership and management are not in the same hands and both depend on financial investment. Shareholders do not own the companies or the natural resources they invest in, they only own their investment. For them, no particular economic basis matters since investments can just go elsewhere if one source of profit no longer exists. Financialization has thus decoupled private profit from productivity. There are certainly managers, employees and shareholders who are genuinely interested in finding or funding the best solutions to current problems, but the most prominent interest of a corporation that depends on investment money will be to pay back investments and as long as the selling factor within a competitive job market is high wages, revenues have to be even higher to pay managers and highly qualified workers. But if revenues are the main goal of a company and all other possible goals will all other possible goals will be compromised by that. In a democratic process, we could decide to all have less income and consume less resources, ban certain technologies and the use of certain substances if they have proven to be detrimental to the environment. A corporation trying to maximize its profits cannot do that. Let me give you an example. Agribusiness has quite successfully managed to frame intensive farming, genetically modified crops, and technological assistance for small-scale farming as the most promising and possibly the only option to feed the growing world population. It has also convinced many governments of developing countries to open their markets and integrate smaller farms into a liberalized infrastructure to give them access to bigger markets. But this will neither lead to a more sustainable management of natural resources, nor will it lead to a more resilient economy in developing countries. To cut a long story short, intensive farming mainly produces cash crops that are either not used for food at all or are used to produce meat that is consumed in the global north, and it degrades the soil. Genetically modified crops are interesting, but they won't feed the poor unless those poor can pay for seeds and food. This in turn will not be realized by integrating small farmers into national or global markets if the only level they can compete on is their local market with small scale or subsistence farming. Technical equipment will in many cases not help because it is too expensive and maintenance is often not feasible. There are many studies on what actually helps poor regions to improve their situation. They show that technical advice, dissemination of knowledge about certain cultivating cultivation techniques, especially those which um, can be done without high investment, working in cooperatives and other local organizations, and selling to small and medium-sized firms are key to a more efficient and resilient economic basis for small-scale farmers. 475 million out of 570 million farms in the world cultivate less than two hectares. In low-income countries, more than two-thirds of the population is employed on the land. And yet, more than 95% of the research conducted in the in, on the reduction of hunger does not take into account the studies just mentioned, and thus is not relevant for small-scale farmers at all. Most of it is conducted without any contact to farmers and concentrated on single tools to tackle specific problems without evaluating existing practices or the feasibility of the suggested solutions. Why is this? In the last decades, funds for research on hunger has more and more been provided by the private sector with more than half of the funding now coming from agribusiness. 
And so the overwhelming majority of research conducted in universities, think tanks, NGOs, many UN agencies, among them the World Food Programme and the World Bank provides a basis for action that takes the interests and means of a highly technological and competitive industry as starting point to solve the environmental and economic problems of rural areas in the global south. Again, I have a picture which doesn't really make sense because it's distorted here. <laughs> um, so if you see a jurisdiction would normally regulate um, the management of and the cultivation of uh, resources, we see here that um, since agribusiness is at, other than farmers is not the owner of his resources, but um, is run on international investment, creates knowledge and feeds that ah, into jurisdiction um the control of um, cultivating mechanisms does not work sorry for that again so i'm coming to the last part resilient productivity so what could be possible ways to go if we want to have a more sustainable resilient property regime one way proposed for example by pierre dardot and christian laval would be to strengthen the public as the example of agriculture just given shows, public funding and the maintenance of communal services and structures is not only about inclusion and equality, it is also one of the most effective ways to control private actors. Another way would be to effectively control financial assets and the adherence to antitrust law of wealthy individuals and corporations to prevent concentration and promote true competi competition of ideas. Here, government governments face a self-produced problem that is, I think, very much linked to the tale of absolute dominion. In the last years, a series of initiatives have sprung up in England and Germany to find out who owns their town or their country and to raise public awareness of both distribution of and access to land and real estate. Others are campaigning for a more just tax system. I think these initiatives to be highly important, not only because they can put pressure on political decision makers, but also because they can inform the public about the complex structures of property regimes and thereby put some of the dominant stories about productivity, public interest and sustainability into perspective. One of the most important messages from these campaigns is that property is only absolute in so far as the state grants corporations and private persons a high degree of privacy and allows them to evade its own laws, the state's laws, other than that it is pretty much limited, regulated and controlled. The third, maybe most promising way to limit and control would be to charge, to change the way private economic actors work which might actually lead to a rather thorough transformation of society as a whole. In his book, Conceptualizing Capitalism, Geoffrey Hodgson states that, um, quote, massive expansion of worker producer cooperatives or worker self-employment could spell the end of capitalism, at least in the form in which we have known it for the last 200 years, end of quote. If firms do no longer aim at maximizing profit or making profit at all, they can, as the demos in democracies, decide to pursue any end as long as it pays the workers' expenses. Hodgson is referring to our cooperatives and worker-owned companies, but there are other forms of non-profit firms in different jurisdictions. The decisive feature is that the firm owns itself and neither the whole company nor its shares can be sold for profit. Owners and shareholders do only get par value for their shares and have to actively take part in the company's management. Creating alternative legal forms of the firm or cooperative and promoting existing ones could be an effective way to actually limit and control the discretionary power of owners. Collective owners are private with relation to all non-owners, so in this respect there is no difference between a cooperative and a corporation cooperatives and other alternative forms of companies can become quite big and influential. There are some cases in Germany, at least. And there is, of course, no guarantee that they will in per se try to find more sustainable uses of resources. But in so far as they do not aim at maximizing profits, they will grow slower, 
because paying taxes is a natural speed limit on growth, I think, are more likely to be effectively controlled by existing regulations and have at least in theory the opportunity to look for the best solutions for problems of environmental degradation, even if those best solutions would mean that they, the firms will have to find a new occupation. Because from empirical evidence, we know that workers owned firms are much more creative in handling crises and are much more resilient with regard to outer shocks. So to conclude, the structure of property titles will not in and of itself solve the problem of environmental degradation or the distribution of and access to natural resources. Also, bottom-up decision-making processes or limited private discretion will not alter the fact that there are competing strategies and truths about the best ways to cope with natural degradation and climate change, and that there will be interests that are adverse to a more sustainable, resilient economy, even in the most democratic society. The solutions provided by private corporations are attractive because they do on not only serve private interests, they sell solutions to save the world. Environmental regulations are only as good as the knowledge about the problems and their solutions. This is true no matter how inclusive or how effectively controlled production processes are. But there is a big difference between an economy that aims at private profit and one that mainly aims at resilient productivity. To be and stay productive, economic actors have to reflect on the preconditions of their productivity. Private profit, on profit only needs short-term growth in revenues, no matter how they have been created. Limited, limiting and controlling private profit might seem a more demanding task than limiting and controlling private property. And wealth for many is a good thing, so it might also be less sexy than just pointing to evil private owners. But as I tried to show, there is no effective limitation and control of private property without limitation and control of private profit. The problems we associate with property are problems of management of and control over resources, and those aspects cannot be separated from the economic function of different property titles. If we want to address the detrimental effects of decisions taken by economic actors, we should stop talking about absolute rights and private discretion and rather analyze what actors like corporations or wealthy individuals actually do and how property titles and regimes property regimes make their actions possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very stimulating talk. Uh, can you stop sharing the screen so we can see easily if there is a question online? And maybe I can start with the room. Is there any question in the room? I think you can click on the Zoom icon, yeah. Okay, right. Um, so I see no hands for the moment. So I, I can start with just a, a few uh, few comments just to give. Well, uh, just I'm sorry because we are already out of time, but I think it's also take like 10, 15 minutes to, to discuss your paper briefly and, and give the opportunity to the audience to raise questions. So first of all, thanks a lot. Um, I do, well, I, I do have some comments on how your, um, maybe like the, uh, well, it's, uh, it's not really clear for me whether you recommend to abandon uh, the, the idea that this, there is this tale of absolute dominion. Uh, would you recommend that we, we just get rid of that? I, I think we should. Um, it's just that I think we still needed to understand what use is made of this tale, because I mean it's kind of a performative myth somehow, and all, all of uh, Carl Weidekwist's uh, book is, is about that actually, is to say that well, it, when we look to empirical claims, it doesn't work like that, but still you have people that that use it as a way to justify some of the things they do, which might otherwise seem to be quite harsh when you look at it, um, when you look at it, when when you don't uh, think this myth is, is useful. So, um, and the second question is that, well, it's, it's, it's related to that. I mean, if we abandon this, this well, uh, if, if we stop focusing on this tale, um, and we're not also losing what is, I think, um, 
the most important thing also in this tale, uh, which is the, the idea that, well, if I'm the owner of something, I, I have the right to, uh, to decide what I'm going to do. You insist a lot on that, but also I have the right to transfer it to whoever I want. Uh, and this is like all the justification for inequalities too. I mean, the, the state has no right to constrain me or to force me to, uh, to well, to, no, not really to force me, but to impeach me to transfer my property to, let's say, Pierre, because I want to, to give to give my property to Pierre. So this idea is also rooted in, in the same tale. And so I think somehow, well, if, if you want to also address the, the inequality question, don't you need also to tackle this, this myth at the very, Locky and root somehow saying, well, no, uh, at some point we need to think that there might be some restrictions to the right to free transfer. And what I'm thinking too is, well, you, you could easily extend or build or um, you, you can build on the idea of, well, for instance, you don't have the right to transfer your property to a terrorist organization. I mean, I, I cannot uh, make a transfer to Daesh. <laughs> That's simply forbidden, it's a criminal offense. And the, the, the rationale behind that is to say, well, um, if you transfer your property to Daesh, they will use it in a way that will harm other people. So maybe can we not extend also, you know, coming back to this uh, tale and say, well, uh, and, and due to the, you know, like the Article 544 of the, the Civil Code saying, well, property is absolute dominion, even though it is limited by the laws and you cannot use your property in a way that will harm other people. And at some point, uh, inequalities might harm other people. So. You know, coming back to the to, to the tale somehow, to coming back to the to the myth, allow us also to find other ways to justify some limitations, if we manage to uh, to use this well the second part of the article somehow. Uh, you know, the, the the part that says provided that you're not using your property to uh, to either to arm some people or to infringe some uh, some some laws or. Reglementations and then just just a few comments, but may, maybe Michel Bourbon will be interested by that also because I'm wondering whether there is um, um, like a convergence between what you propose and limitarianism. Um, that that might be something that well you might have something to uh, to to exchange on that. And just a last thought on also the maybe the necessity to tackle uh, also the problem by the bottom because, well, in your last example also, I mean, that's a follow up on the discussion we had yesterday at the dinner, sorry for those who weren't there, but um, part of the, the reasons why the farmer acts uh, in a way to maximize his profit and, and finally ends up in um, using or cultivating the land in a way that he doesn't want to, to do, uh, using many, many uh, chemicals and stuff like that, it's, it's because he has no choice somehow. Um, and why is that? Because he has no choice to decide the price at which he will sell the crop because he's tied to the offers that are made by big companies or something like that. Uh, and so would not would there not be also a solution by, you know, kind of a neo-Republican solution saying, well, so, so if we give a basic income to everybody, then at least, you know, you have these basic needs that are covered somehow. And so we, we foster in independence and, and afterwards, people coming on the market come as independent people. So that might be also, it's also yeah, a, a link to, to Cal if you want to jump in. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the thing about this absolute dominion or what, what I call the tale of absolute dominion is that, that it kind of annoys me that there is so much reference to something that does not mean what what people think it means. I mean, what I tried to show is that that um, with reference to this, to the English law until, I don't know, the 19th century is that you can actually not transfer your land um, to uh, anyone. So it's, it's not uh, free discretion to transfer as you want. Um, and yeah, I would, I would still, I think, promote uh, a more complex notion and picture of property, also really to kind of educate the public what property actually is, because I think that many of the attractive um, arguments for market society stems from the idea of this productive entrepreneur who uh, I don't know, manages his resources in the most productive way. And this is just false. So um, so they, they I would think it, it would kind of 
they would be a merit of not talking about absolute dominion. I, as I said, it is a legal term which just says to the exclusion of all others, but then that also can be qualified. So not even that is uh, really fixed. Um, and especially not in English law. Um, the second libertarianism, um, yeah, I, I should have pointed out more that um, I, I don't take, I'm not arguing for, let's say, the establishment of, of commons or, or of, um, the firms without regulation. So I'm still arguing for state regulation. Um, yeah. And the other thing, I'm not an expert on basic income. I, I have difficulties to think how that. I mean, if it if it is um, if it's one by taxing. So the, the thing I was arguing for more is like having local markets and not um, going into uh, like national markets, and then you have don't have the dependency on big firms, um, and that's what empirically also works. Um, yeah, but but uh, they I would have to. I'm yeah. So I'm not opposed. To, this would be also uh, one solution. Yes. Okay, I think you called on your mic went off, but I think you called on me. Uh, yeah, I, I thought this is great. It has a lot of overlap with my work. I'm looking about, you know, do individuals appropriate and even and, and you're looking at even in the earliest appropriation literature, did they think that appropriation, you're appropriating something absolute? And yeah, that's like both like fill in missing pieces from the other. So I, I think it's great. Uh, I hope you know you. There's, there's that this is part of a growing genre. Uh, it's not just me, you, and Grant, but also people like uh, Enzo Rossi and uh, David Graeber who are debunking uh, a lot of these myths that are out there. There's a whole bunch of people doing this right now. And I think it's great to have another person doing this. Uh, now, there is another way to, and it just occurred to me during your, 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 your discussion Eric, that that that, um, that there is another way to tackle this is when they say when one of the ways that property has never been and can never be absolute is that idea that you can harm another person with your property, um, and and that's I mean that's written into law, you know, going back to Roman property law that you 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 can't harm people with it. But actually, well, if you consider environmental harms as harms of neighboring individuals who also have a property in themselves, uh, there's really, that really uh, justifies lots and lots of regulation, uh, lots and lots of regulation, even of what is, could be otherwise thought of as an absolute, uh, absolute property. Right, thanks, Carl. I... I give the, the microphone to Clemence and then afterwards to Michel and then maybe time for the very last question, but otherwise we... Uh, at some point in your paper, you mentioned the word uh, expropriation and I'm not sure I was uh, really able to, to grasp uh, what you meant at that point. So it's more about uh, asking you to, to clarify uh, than a comment or a question. Uh, so you mentioned the word expropriation while tackling the question of the agrarian activities and what should be produced uh, in, in priority. So did you mean by uh, addressing expropriation that um, uh, the environmental activism should foster expropriation because uh, um, in this wrong tale of pri private property as absolute dominion, uh, it is pointless to uh, argue for another use of the land, another type of production, because the landowners would answer that it is a restriction of, of use, uh, thus neglecting the fact that the restriction of use um, is inherent to uh, agrarian activities. So you know, I was wondering uh, that uh, if uh, what you meant was that because of that tale, um, it is in the short term, uh for uh, it because of the tail is in the short term and uh, expropriation the solution that uh, environmental activism should aim for thank you well no 
when I refer to expropriation, I referred to uh, people saying that regulations or taxation is expropriation. You find in many, I don't know, especially in newspaper articles on, for example, I don't know if you know that, but we have in Berlin, we have this movement, activist movement of expropriating um, the biggest housing company um, because rents are going so high um, and they are proposing to expropriate them, which is not really the case because interestingly, in the um, German civil code, you have actually um, in article 15, you have the possibility to socialize um, important resources, that, but that would be socializing and not expropriating. So, and they, I mean, and then the, the other way would be to just highly regulate the, the whole housing market, but then those um, corporations would say, well, that is expropriation because we are not, we, we can't really make profit. And that's, I think that's, that is a perverted idea of private profit, uh, um, private property that it should always include um, maximizing private profits because that's not, I mean, that, that is not inherently con connected, I would think. Okay, um, thank you very much, Eva, for the talk. And uh, yeah, thank you, Eric, for bringing the, the notion of limitarianism in the discussion. I, I think uh, it's a recurrent topic uh, all along this workshop to say that we should limit or constraint uh, property in some way. And I think here we have a very strong contrast uh, in the presentation when you speak in terms of absolute dominion or absolute property, and then with the idea of limited property or limited appropriation. So I think it's uh, it's very interesting to put these two notions into perspective to, to think about what is, what is wrong with the way we have been thinking about property and the way we should think ab about property now. And um, I have one special case that comes into mind uh, when we speak in terms of uh, absolute dominion is uh, especially the way we uh, we treat animals today and, and i don't know if you know this uh, american uh, legal philosopher gary francione is speaking a lot about how we apply our conception of property on animals to justify what we are doing to them especially domesticated animals and uh, if we think in in terms of um, uh, industrial livestock farming. Here we have also a very strong ecological dimension. In, industrial livestock farming has a lot of very, very bad environmental issues in terms of pollution, uh, water use, but also in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And I think one very strong reason why we should move away towards this idea of uh, property as absolute property over animals and other uh, environmental entities is that it, it has a very uh, deep and problematic environmental issues. And um, uh, one of the reasons why Franciona speaks um, so much about property in the context of uh, animals is that, first of all, it really creates uh, harms towards animals. So this idea that uh, with absolute property, uh, we cannot harm other people. It works as long as we consider animals not as persons and people. And what he's trying to do is exactly moving the picture uh, to change our perception of animals as no more as property, but as persons. And I think going with an idea of limited property and limitarianism can be one way to, to do this shift from absolute property to, to limited property. But I have the impression that you totally agree with this. So that's, that's more a comment. I don't know if you want, if it gives you any other idea, but I think really this idea of limitarianism is a, is a very useful way to try to to conceptualize this shift yeah yes but i'm i'm not so sure about the the animals rights but but i would uh, totally agree on um limited rights and also good reasons for limitations <laughs> thank you okay speaking of limits uh <laughs> I think we'll reach one. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks for these two days. I want also to thank again all of our sponsors that also made it possible for us to have at least two hybrid conference. So the FNRS, the Université Bordeaux Montaigne, also the Wiener Unspike Foundation and the Faculté de Philosophie et Sciences Sociales de l'ULB. So thanks to them. Um, thanks to all of you 
who well who was sat through these two long days but i think very very interesting and we we had so so many interesting discussions and so many excellent papers so i think i, I can speak for pierre and and myself as, as well at least for me i can speak but i think pierre is do agree uh, to to say that we were really happy uh, on how this conference went on the quality of the papers and on the quality of the discussion so we really hope to um to have a publication uh, following this conference we will of course keep you updated on that um i just make a last announcement to say that we will probably do um well use the website of the conference to publicize the recordings uh, except of course if you want to send us an email because you don't want your uh or you do not give your consent for the recording uh being published uh if you in that case please feel free to to write to us but otherwise we will uh publish the uh recordings of the conference on the website so we thank you again we hope to keep in touch and if you want to write to uh, if you want to write to some of the other to give some follow-up comments on the presentation, please, uh, please do. You have all the emails in the listing, or you can write to Pierre or me to, to ask for an email. So thanks again. Um, we hope to see you soon, maybe for the Y Private Property Tree <laughs> uh, in, a, in a not so far future, maybe at least two years, or at least at one time when it won't be a pandemic time. So it will be a bit easier to organize something uh and we will have the pleasure to be all together and not on two separate days so thanks again and